Hello everyone, welcome to another video by Jeevata.com. I am Rajdeep Ghosh. Today's video will be about the theory of monovariance. It is a direct successor video to the video on the theory of invariance. The concept is that unlike invariance, monovariance deal with quantities which instead of staying the same, change monotonically, as in the increase or decrease in the same way with each step. So for example, for example, If my monovariant is m, then with each step of the process, it can either increase or say stay the same or increase. But the point is that it will never decrease. Similarly, my monovariant could decrease, stay the same maybe for a few steps and then decrease. But the thing is, it will never increase. This is what we call a monotonic change. So monovariant is a quantity that behaves like this with respect to the process. These quantities help us determine the existence of end states of the process. Well, not necessarily just the existence. You can also say certain things about uh, existence and properties of the end states if they exist. Um, and how, how do monovariants help us do this? Well, if we know that with each step of the process, a monovariant just increases, then, and if we can also, if you also know beforehand that the monovariant is bounded somehow, if we know that there is an upper bound on monovariant, clearly the monovariant can't keep on increasing forever, which means that the process also cannot keep on going forever. Same for it moving in the lower direction. So this is how monovariants help us talk about whether a process ends or not. The relevant problem that we'll be discussing is from the St. Petersburg contest from 1996. Obviously, as usual, at the end, there is a challenge problem for the viewers. The incentive for the best comments, solutions, and otherwise is a mention in the next video, and the best responders over a month would be considered for the Ramanujan Scholarship at cheetah.com. To read more about the Ramanujan Scholarship, feel free to pause here. So the problem that we're looking at is that several positive integers are written on a blackboard. One can raise any two distinct integers and write their greatest common divisor and least common divisor and least common multiple instead. Prove that eventually the numbers will stop changing. So what we have is that we start with some numbers a1, a2, an on a blackboard. And what we do is we take to some two numbers, say ai we make it, and we replace them, we replace them with their GCD and their LCM. Note that this is a replacement. So we don't actually keep AI and AJ anymore. For example, say our list contains two and three. So we replace them. So, so we'll delete 2 and 3, and we'll add 1 and 6 to the set S. So we call this S. What we want to show is that the, the set will eventually stop changing. That eventually, when you do this process, you'll end up with the same numbers. Now, when can that happen? Let's take an example. Say it happens that A divides B. Say, say we take A and B such that A is a divisor of B. Obviously, in that case, the GCD is A and the LCM is B. I mean, think about why this should be true. In fact, this is the only way we can start with AB, replace them by the GCD and LCM, and actually get A and B back. So this gives us an idea the, that, well, that the only way the step will stop changing, that, that set S will stop changing, is if eventually, for all A less than equal to B, A has to divide B. So this gives us an idea. Let's say I define a set A is equal to all pairs in set of pairs in B, A, B element of S, such that A does not divide B. Now, why, do, why does it make sense to do this? Uh, and also, a uh, sl slight cutaway. Um, say, you, say you start with A1, A2. You turn it into the you take these two, replace them by the GCD. Notice what happens if you take the same pair again. Say you take the A1A2, replace them by the GCD and LCM, and now use the same process on the GCD and LCM. Since the GCD divides the LCM, you'll get the same numbers back. Right? And uh, and if, if you have a hard time believing why the GCD should divide the LCM, maybe you can go back and watch my video on prime numbers where we start uh, wrote uh, natural numbers as multi sets of prime numbers. So, and we saw that the GCD was the intersection of the multi-set and the LCM was the union.
clearly the GCD is always uh, clearly the intersection is always contained in the union. So A intersection B is always a subset of A union B. And what did we learn about subsets is that if C is a subset of D, then C must then be well. If C was a subset of D, and C and D being the multisets of C and D respect of small C and small D respectively, then the C must divide D. So this means the GCD must always divide the LCM. Right. So coming back to our set A. Notice what happens every time you take a pair A does not divide B. Clearly, we'll get new numbers. The thing is, as soon as you get new numbers, well, first of all, you lose these two numbers. So A first, then you delete these two numbers, is the size of A goes down. So mod A becomes mod A minus 1. But the thing is, we never get these two numbers back. It reduces for good. Now we get GCD and LCM. And and this divides. So we every single time you take two elements in this set A, so you take an element A B element of A, you and you do this process on this pair, you will not get it back. So what do we have? Every time we do the every we take we do this process, either the size of set A does not change. So maybe you took two pairs that divide each other each other anyway, in which case you don't get anything, you just get A and A B back. So mod A is, unaffect, uh, is unaffected, or you take a pair in A, in which case mod A goes down. In either case, we can consider mod A to be, an, to be a monovariate. The monovariate we are looking for is mod A. Notice what happens as soon as A gets empty. As soon as A gets empty, A equals 5, A equals 5, which means that now for all A less than equals B, A divides B. And now the set doesn't change anymore. So clearly something fun has happened. We start with A and it keeps getting smaller and smaller. But the thing is, we know that if this keeps happening, it will eventually become empty because you know the set size is decreasing, and as soon as it becomes empty, we'll be done. And the process will have to end. So this is so, and so well, we're done with this problem. Our monovariant was the size of this set A. Notice how it, did, it took just a little bit of cleverness. But the thing is, the monovariant, it in a way, uh, it's a, it encompasses the main structure of the problem. So that's what our goals usually have to be. You have to construct a, a monovariant that's useful. And in general, it depicts something very center, it's very, uh, at, at the very center of the problem. It has to be something very central to the problem. That is what I was trying to say. Um, well, this was one example of a problem in which the existence of a, in which the monovariant helped us uh, helped us determine whether the process ends or not. Sometimes the monovariant helps us say something, say some properties about the process. So this is a problem from the Stanford Putnam training of two thousand seven. We have an n by n grid. We have an n by n grid. Initially, n minus one cells are infected. Are infected. Each second, one cell, a, a cell, cell adjacent to adjacent to two infected cells, at least two. These two infected cells gets infected. Gets infected. Show that at least one cell remains uninfected at the end of the process. Clearly, uh, the process must eventually end. Well, for starters, because your grid is finite, and you know, eventually. We'll, we'll stop getting any cells that are already not infected and also not adjacent to two infected cells. Well, again, because of the finiteness of, finiteness of the setup. Notice one thing. If I look at two infected cells, I'm drawing infected cells as colored, as, uh, well, not colored, but lined out like this. And you look at this cell, it's currently uninfected. So say in this step, this cell becomes infected. So we get this. What has changed? But for starters, the area has increased. Net area of infected cells has increased. So you could say, okay, so that's a nice monovariant. Well, the issue is that it's not a very useful one. 
the ob obviously the area has to increase in fact in yourself it's not a very useful runaway it doesn't give us much the perimeter on the other hand now that's a nice one variant because it gives us new information look at what happened to the perimeter think of this edge as a door this door opened up and it got this and again think of this edge as, as the door it opened up and like this and now this is what we got clearly we just shifted around edges we didn't add any new edges so the perimeter is the same perimeter is the same so there is a very strong temptation to declare that well, the perimeter must be an invariant. Sadly, this is not necessarily always the case. But don't be discouraged. If you look at this problem, if you look at this situation where three cells are infected, what happens? Well, the perimeter actually drops since only one, since only one door has to open up and the other two get erased anyway. So if we consider this as a door, it opens up and these two other just get erased. So the perimeter actually drops from two. But one thing that is to be noticed is that either that the perimeter will drop or it will stay the same. In no case does the perimeter increase. So the perimeter is actually a monovariant. And this time it's a useful one. What is the initial perimeter? It's whatever it is, it has to be less than four times n, n minus one. You know, you start off with a gradient effect n minus one cells. The size of one, say, the edge of one cell is just of size one, and the maximum perimeter you can get is four times. So the perimeter of one cell is four. You have n minus one cells. The maximum per possible perimeter is four times n minus one. It is possible to be less than that. Say these two squares share an edge, in which case their total perimeter is seven, sorry six. So it whatever the perimeter initial perimeter is, it has to be less than equal to four n minus one. Say the whole grid gets infected. So now you have an n by n grid, all of which is infected. What is the net perimeter of infect infected cells? It is 4 times n. So it seems like it has increased. So for the full cell to be, full grid to be infected, the perimeter has to increase. But that is not possible. We already saw that the perimeter is a monovariant in the decreasing direction. So clearly, this end state is not possible and one cell it hence must always remain unaffected and will die. So we saw two ways in which monovariance can help us. And the recap of the underlying idea is that to comment on whether a process ends or not, associate a quantity with a state that increases or decreases monotonically with each step and make sure that the quantity is bounded. Hence, the process cannot go on forever. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. Keep increasing, but if there is a, if there is a roof, it cannot increase forever. And hence the process cannot go on forever if the value of this quantity increases in each step of the process. Clearly you only have finitely many steps to go. Here's the challenge problem. Feel free to pause and solve it for yourself and write down the solution in the comments. Thank you so much.